A familiar woman runs toward me. A small child's perched on each hip, jostling with every one of her fervent steps. One is crying from having just been preemptively unlatched from her still hanging breast. Della? Oh my goddess! Hello! She wraps me up in a protective hug, each child's face squished awkwardly against both sides of my chest. Hello, I respond confidently. I wonder how long we're going to play the small talk game before she realizes I don't remember her whatsoever, let alone her name. How have you been? Goddess, it's been so long. It's been, what, how many years now? I ask her, hoping her answer will lead to some kind of recognition. Easily since 10th grade. Your cousin came to the compound just before we moved. My family left after... Uh, well, it's, it's not important. All that matters is I'm here now. The month I turned 18, I walked out my front door, drove out here, and never looked back. Jesus, I think to myself. Why the fuck would anyone who actually got to escape ever want to come back? My family's been stuck here our whole lives. They don't acknowledge any other way of life. A pert, clear of her throat breaks me from my inner monologue. <clears throat> what about you? How have you been doing? Your hair has gotten so long. You've always been such a pretty little thing. Have you made your contribution? Murph and I have six now. Can you believe it? She inquires, eyes alight with the anticipation of my response. I knew this was coming. I'm just surprised it took her so long. Yep, I have a daughter, Sasha. She's seven years old. It took us a little while at first, but she was worth every heartbreak along the way. The smile I've practiced to the point of obsession peels across my lips. It's extremely important to crinkle the corners of my eyes to make it look real. No one's going to believe me if I'm dead-faced. Just one, then? Are you planning for another? The woman asks warily. I still don't know her goddamn name! Well, this was certainly new. Usually telling these people I have a child, a daughter no less, satiates them enough to stop the questions. The smile fades from my face one muscle at a time in preparation for the next part of my answer. Um, no, not yet anyway. We lost Sasha's father when she was five. I haven't gathered the courage to try again. Her face puckers like she just performed fellatio on a lemon. Oh. Goddess, I'm so sorry. I had no idea. Me and my big mouth, right? Listen, I've been married a long time, but you can always talk to me, all right? Give me your phone so I can give you my number. Finally, I'll know her damn name. Of course, thank you so much. I'd like that. She types in her contact information and hands it back. Maya. Her name is Maya. Okay. One more smile makes an appearance on my face as I turn to leave the encounter. My feet almost make it out of the aisle when I hear her call after me. You know, it's never too late, right? Children are our future. You never know what contribution your children will make to our world. That conversation pretty much sums up all you need to know about the community that we live in. A flyer for the town meeting is perched under my windshield wiper. I remove it with more than a little annoyance and get in my car. The drive home depresses me. I've driven it dozens if not hundreds of times. I know where all the holes in the fence are. Sasha and I always sing a silly song during these parts to distract her, but I look. 
years of conditioning and cognitive mental therapy scream at me not to look, but I do every time just the same. Passing glances provide me different views of horror. The women are dirty, literally dressed in rags. Their faces are haunted with years of neglect. To our town, they are refuse, a waste of human populace. Being childless robbed them of the blessings and way of life the contributors experienced. The barren, as they call them, are forced to contribute in other ways. These women are farmhands, overworked cooks, not even allowed to eat the food they make, landfill workers, medicinal experimentees, and so forth. And I am supposed to be one of them. My mind takes me back to a place in time just before Sasha became mine. A distant wailing woke Sharon and I from a deep sleep one evening. Our limbs lingered in their embrace longer than necessary for the situation, hoping it was the remnants of a dream. Sharon was the first one dressed. She ushered me over to our bedroom window to peer outside. I ran over to her, almost forgetting to leave the socially acceptable amount of space between our anxious bodies. The street looked quiet, empty even. No one was outside. Everything was still, save for the shivering of the leaves from the cold night air. Only one car was on the street. The lights inside were on, and the silhouette of the person inside was completely immobile. It was definitely apparent that they weren't the one making the noise. Although Sharon challenged me, I was the one who went outside to investigate. Someone out there needed help. I was sure of it. Each step toward the car felt like it slowed a consecutive second in time. Each step toward the car felt like it slowed a consecutive moment in time. The last step seemed to take hours. My hand froze mere inches before knocking on the glass. The scene seized any communication between my brain and my body. I found myself temporarily frozen in place, my sanity not allowing me to move until I could make sense of what I was seeing. A dark-haired woman sat at the driver's seat. She didn't look to be much younger than myself at the time. Her once brown eyes were cloudy and lifeless, frozen in an eternal thousand-yard stare. There's foam crystallized at the corners of her lips, and a needle hung limp in her arm, still embedded in a vein. The worst part of all this was what was in the back seat. A red-faced baby girl not more than three or four months old, cried incessantly in her car seat. Her voice was strained from calling out. Her eyes were just barely to the point of producing tears. I unbuckled her and rocked her in my arms, making sure to survey the street for onlookers or gapped curtains. Thankfully, there were none. Sharon gently took the baby from me and held her to her chest. In a split-second moment of doubt, I ran out and unbuckled the car seat to take inside with me. Looking back now, it's a miracle we held together through it all. Timing was heavily in our favor. Whether it was God or goddess, someone was definitely on our side that year. I've always been a bigger gal. It wasn't too much of a stretch to assume I was pregnant and didn't show much. A close friend in need of a home agreed to act as her father in exchange for a place to live. I wasn't lying earlier when I said we lost him when Sasha was five. Not everyone can make it here. The way people are raised makes them truly believe they can't have a successful life anywhere else. Mitch ate a bullet one night after dinner, and that was that. I kept to myself mostly. No one could know too much if they didn't get too close. And if you hadn't guessed by now, Sharon is not my cousin. Love doesn't mean much to a community that only cares about repopulation. If anyone knew what we really were... We'd be taken to the municipal office cells and offered what they call a choice. Those who are found to be living against their way of life are brought into rooms full of voracious male occupants, their pants clinging tightly to the growing bulges of their groins as they stare hungrily at whichever woman is brought in, like a raw steak tossed to a pit of starving hounds. Town leaders arrive and offer two options to our kind. Women could consent to repeated sexual encounters with each of the men, or choose not to and be tossed outside the walls of the comfortable compound with the other wastes of society. Those who chose the first option were housed and subjected to constant breeding rituals until they became pregnant. If conception failed after one calendar year, 
Then they also became exiled outside of, outside of the compound walls for being a non-contributing member. Rules were set into place to protect the physical safety of the women forced to live outside the confines of our walls, but they aren't usually enforced. More men travel outside the walls each day to pillage and violate those poor women, each being allowed discreet entry back after their varied conquests. Women beaten, sometimes to the point of death, are provided no medical care. If someone gets sick, they're weeded out to make room for those more physically able to perform their tasks. It isn't right, but who's there to stop them? The leaders that would hear the cries for justice are the very ones that put those rules there in the first place. Flyers about town meetings were all over. It seemed like every telephone poll, store bulletin board, and town mailbox were inundated with them. Everyone seemed swept up in it. Even Sharon talked about going once or twice. Maybe it would look better if we went to blend in rather than stay away completely. At any rate, it doesn't matter now. I just want to love on my girls. Sasha's curls bounced playfully as she ran out to greet me. Even though she'll be taller than me soon, I still see that little red-faced baby screaming in the face of death in that car. How's it going, baby girl? Did you have a good day today? I missed you, I ask as I throw my arms around her, grocery bags hanging off wrists and all. She sees me struggling and takes the lighter bags so I can distribute the weight of the heavier ones more evenly. She's always been so sweet. It must have come from her biological family. I was a terribly hateful child. It was made very apparent to me at an early age that I would have to fight for my right to be happy and safe in the world I grew up in. It resulted in a very guarded and lonely upbringing. My daughter looks at me with sudden concern. Mama Sharon isn't doing so good today. She's been doing that thing where she doesn't hear me and just stares out the window. It creeps me out when she does that. I try my best to force the giggle to pass it off as quirkiness or the effects of her mother being a deep thinker. In all reality though, I know what's coming. Every once in a great while my love gets down. Really down. Like so down she can look up at a clear sky for hours and still not see the sun. It kills her that she can't be open about who she is. Who we are. She hates it that she has to act like an extended family member to Sasha instead of her mother. So many times in public we've wanted to kiss, stare longingly, even a small brush of hands would mean so much sometimes. We can't do that though. Not to mention she's under pressure for not adding a contribution of her own. She's filed appeal after appeal, but her time has come due. She has four months left to become pregnant, but she refuses to share her body with anyone but me, no matter what the cost. It's been affecting our sleep as well. I'd feel her fitful tossing and turning against me as we slept. Some nights I'd roll over and she wouldn't even be there at all. For the sake of the stress of that damn meeting in the early morning, I selfishly hope tonight isn't one of those nights. Two melatonin gummies have me feeling relaxed and ready to fall asleep in a little over 20 minutes. My honey was on her own tonight. This bitch needs some much deserved sleep. Terrible dreams chase me all through my sleep. Suffocating plumes of smoke surround the room that I'm in. It's very familiar, but yet not immediately recognizable at the same time. Men are clutching at their throats blindly. Some have blood and gore running down their face from gouged eyes. Others have deep black-red stains spreading on the groins of their pants. Flames licked at the air from behind a closed door. No one could escape, and the fire wouldn't be held back for long. My body jolts awake with a start. The taste of screams and ash still flavor my tongue. I cry out to Sharon through horrified tears, only to find that she isn't next to me. The sun's just starting to flirt with the tops of the trees. Daybreak has barely threatened to arrive. The air feels off. Our home is a little too peaceful. Everything is unsettlingly still. The acoustics of the floorboards let me know that I'm about to enter a room with a heavy object in the middle of the floor. Sharon, it's me, sweetheart. Are you alright, babe? I had a soul fucking nightmare and I need cuddles, okay? My feet stop dead in their tracks. My body movements in response to the sight before me instantly take me back to finding Sasha as a baby. Sharon is okay. She is alive. She is smiling. But she... 
Well, she's definitely not the same. The love of my life sits in a disheveled clump on her living room floor. Her forearms and face are covered in blood, gore, and soot. Two orbs with brown irises are clenched tightly in her left hand. Dells, my dearest, it's all going to be okay. I got those evil bastards, and no one will ever have to hide who they are again. I've finally made my contribution. Have you made your contribution by N.M. Brown, my buddy?